grasping the thin, almost translucent veil between that of fact and fiction, revealing mysteries of the past, folklore passed down from father to son, unsolved murders, and things that go bump in the night. You've entered Deceptive Reality. Hello and welcome to another life-changing episode of the Deceptive Reality <laughs> Podcast. My name is Nick and with me is the ever-valiant Bert. Oh, I'm valiant. Listen, I know that word, yeah. Nick. There's yeah, sometimes that's an easy when one. you hit me with a word I know, I'm like, yes, I know that word. Have More you ever noticed not, the I don't pattern? Know the word. Do you notice the pattern yet? No. There's a two-parter. I go real difficult on the first one, and then I throw you a slow oh, bitch yeah. on the second I one. I didn't even acknowledge that till you just said that, Nick. That's true. Yeah. Dang. I never even noticed that. Yeah. Did you Did you That's also so notice legendary. that this is a life-changing episode coming up? It is. It is a life-changing episode. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, if you listen to part one, we covered one tidbit towards the end. Mm-hmm. This one's this episode, as you can see, is is a humdinger. It's a long one, but keyword is but we covered a lot of things that we uh, I think is kind of adds a little bit of intrigue mm-hmm. to this mm-hmm. whole shroud thing. Oh yeah. But listen, I know it's been a week. It's easy to forget some history in a week. So let's look back at last week. Let's go. In a land steeped in prophecy and turmoil, under a sky heavy with foreboding, a story unfolds that will echo through the ages. A man, hailed by many as a savior, condemned by others as a heretic, hangs upon a wooden cross. His body, weary from the trials of betrayal and suffering, is etched with pain. As the sun begins to set, casting long shadows upon the ground, the man breathes his last. His followers, stricken with grief and disbelief, watch as his lifeless body is carefully taken down from the cross. In the embrace of twilight, they prepare his body for burial, wrapping it in a linen cloth. The dawn of the third day breaks with a hushed whisper of wonder. A group of women, their hearts laden with sorrow, approach the tomb. But what they find is not the solemn finality of death, but an empty sepulcher, the linen cloth lying alone. The man they mourned, gone. A mystery unfolds, leaving an imprint not just on the fabric but in the annals of history. This story, so deeply woven into the fabric of faith and skepticism, sets the stage for our journey today. A journey into one of history's most enigmatic and debated relics, the Shroud of Turin. Never heard of it. <laughs> no, just... but are you ready to... This is probably... This probably isn't the one you're looking for, but it's a close second one, I think. Okay, let's hear it. Are you are you ready to hear it? I am ready. Let's go. The Gospel of John narrates a harrowing moment. John 19, 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. This act of scourging, a brutal prelude to the crucifixion, is a moment of profound suffering. In the ancient Roman legal system, scourging was a common form of punishment, often used as a precursor to crucifixion. The victim was whipped with a flagrum, a whip with multiple leather thongs, often tipped with metal or bone. This cruel instrument was designed to inflict severe pain and deep, lacerating wounds. As we examine the Shroud of Turin, the fabric bears silent testimony to this aspect of the Passion. Across the back of the figure on the shroud, we see numerous linear wounds, consistent with the marks of a Roman flagrum. These marks are not merely superficial, they speak of a deep and savage beating, leaving a trail of pain imprinted on the cloth. The precision and distribution of these scourging marks on the shroud are notable. They cover the back in a manner that suggests a systematic and thorough lashing, not just a random act of violence. The wounds appear to wrap around the body, indicating that the victim was likely tied in a position that exposed the back completely. In the stark and brutal marks of scourging on the Shroud of Turin, we find a disturbing yet powerful parallel to the biblical narrative. I always find that part troubling. Like, that's hard to listen to, don't you find? It is. It's... 
I think the hardest part for me when I listen to that is to understand that this wasn't, unfortunately, just a Jesus thing. Mm. This was relatively common to do, not necessarily at the degree that they did it to Jesus, but they, this was something that happened to a lot of the bad people and some of them deserved Mm -hmm. it. Some of them didn't. Yep. But, uh, Uh, man, I I really don't know if anyone deserves it really. Like I'm not a big fan of that kind of punishment, but I'd probably think differently if they had done something to me. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. Like there's always not even necessarily about me, but more so like if someone Mm. did something to my family, Oh yeah. Like to well, my they wouldn't kid? make it to there. They wouldn't yeah, make but I mean, if they did, like you <laughs> yeah. would want the ultimate retribution, right? Um, yeah, for which, sure. I don't know if you know this or not. Do you know what the maximum amount of lashes was that someone was supposed to receive? Uh, it's funny because I was going to bring this up because it's mm-hmm. it's a saying that at least around here is pretty common. Mm -hmm. It's like 40 lashes or something like that. I can't remember what the exact number was, but they calculated down how many people could have and survive. Yes. That's how good they were at it. Next question. Did you know why it was 40? Um, 40 lashes was what they considered. In which I forget how many, uh, I want to call them talons. They're not talons, but how many of those leather straps there were? I want to say there was like five to eight and each one of them had either bone or metal Mm -hmm. on the end. Yeah. And when they would hit the back, these were long. So when they would hit the back, a lot of times they'd curl around and hit the sides or the back of the legs or whatever it was. But this, this was like flaying you basically. Correct. Yeah. It would be like the equivalent of taking a knife and just cutting eight to nine. And these are like, this is not just skin. This is ripping muscle out of your body. Yeah. This is like, this is probably besides being caught on fire, the mm. most painful thing that can occur. And it's happening over and over. Like, at what point do you not acknowledge the pain anymore? Is it lash right. 20? Is it lash mm. 10? Uh, do you know how many times Jesus was lashed, supposedly based on biblical? Uh, well, he wasn't expected, like, this was leading up to a death penalty. So, yes. I imagine they didn't give a rat's took us about, <laughs> about the 40 lashing limit. How many was it? 39. Because oh, they were scared okay. well, I guess 40 they, would kill him. Yeah. Man. I wonder what time that took. Right. Uh, you know, I don't really know. I So, funny enough, I, I watched a reenactment um, where some of these people, they do suffer. Like, they don't put the bone and obviously the metal on the end, hmm. but they was hitting them with the leather. And that felt like that went forever. It literally yeah. felt like it went on forever. Because when I was mm-hmm. watching, I was like, now imagine having pieces of your flesh ripped out each one of those oh, times. Yeah. Like yeah, that was gruesome. <laughs> gruesome. It was absolutely yeah. a horrific way. Now, again, going back to those photos, if you look at uh, images of, let me see, what's the best one? <laughs> Shoot, do I not have a good one on the back? Oh, what about the one called Resize? Mm. It's not really the image I would like. Let me look for another one here while we talk about this. But when you look at the Shroud of Turin and you look at the back. Oh, no. It's significantly pretty gruesome. Like it's clearly this person would have suffered immensely. And you can legit see the marks where the blood again pulled, right? Because we talk about the blood pulling. Um, I'm adding a file to that, Nick. 
that okay. you'll be able to see right. Well, if I can find where I put it, uh, it is uploading now. Um, but it's called like S A Y X T T. But if you look at that, when mm-hmm. you look at the back of it, again, and this this goes back to the thorns. Look at the very back; you can see the white spots. That would have been the pulling of the blood up where the crown would have been. But when you look at the back of the legs, and you look at the back. At even like uh, right the bottom of the thighs, all those white oh, yeah. marks is where the blood would have pulled. And think about it: if someone got thirty nine lashes, and again they're hitting the back, but the lashes are falling down into the legs, and you can see mm. that depicted in that photo. Yeah, pretty pretty gruesome. Very gruesome way. Now again. This is just me looking at this from a, could this have been Jesus standpoint? Based on scripture, this would have fallen right into place. And this is not something that our first guy, the second family, the third, they would have, they would have never seen this. So, was this common practice before a crucifixion as well, or uh, depending on what the person did? Yes, because again, oh, okay, Romans was all about making you suffer. If you did something wrong mm. or something they didn't like, they made you suffer, and they wanted your family to watch it. Right, it's all about getting in line. If you do something wrong, look at what I did to your dad, or look at what I did to your brother, or look right. at what I did it, whomever. They wanted you to suffer and they wanted the world to see it. That's why they crucified people. Mm. They wanted there because what would happen is when they would crucify someone, typically their family would be out there watching their loved one die. That's And they put it on display. Oh, yeah. I mean, they put it on display. They wanted you to Mm. see. Kind of like now, like when here in the States... And honestly, I feel dumb for not knowing this. Do you guys execute people in Canada? Uh, we don't do that anymore. Interesting. Okay. So here in the States, depending on where you live in the States, some States we still execute people. Right. I think it's mostly lethal injection now, isn't it? Uh, I think there's only one place that still has an electric chair. Everywhere else is lethal mm. injection or um, there's another way that they do it, but I, I, I don't want to speak on that because I don't know that they do that anymore. But lethal injection is the vast majority of the states. It's supposed to be quick, painless, in and out. Right. But we're talking a matter of minutes. These people, when they were put up on these crosses and then the suffering they would deal with before that was very long periods of time. I was just fact is- checking myself. <laughs> Oh, you're fine. Yeah, it's 1976 is the last time we ever did the death penalty. Oh, yeah. See, we still execute people here. And I believe in my state, we've still executed some people. Okay. So there's a few states that we still do it. Texas is a big one for that. So the, there's uh, a few big last, states, not just those. But. The last hanging in all of Canada happened, uh, I'd say, about a half hour from here. It's wow. called the Hanging Oak, and now it's an oak tree with a antique shop underneath of it. Isn't that interesting? Do they do like any kind mm-hmm. of ghost things or anything there? I would assume that'd be like a ghost hotspot kind of selling no. supernatural stuff. Wow, they're missing no. an opportunity right there. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've we've got a lot of ghost walks in town here because there's a mm-hmm. lot of stuff to see. And I've been on like 30 of them now they're probably so tired of seeing me at these things <laughs> nick's becoming a professional i was just telling him when we was off air i just bought the other day a uh, little body cam like the police have mm. that's got night vision and uh it's gonna be for when we go on our own little ghost excursions yeah but unlike police cams we're not gonna turn them off when something Bad happens. happens. Exactly. We're going to leave them. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. Police, please don't hurt us. Uh, Yeah, please don't. (laughs) Please don't. (laughs) Um, You know, but going back to these floggings, Mm. that would be a horrific way. Now, 
I don't want you to look too close to this picture, get too much of a thought process, Nick. Mm -hmm. But they did a reenactment or not a reenactment, a uh, 3D imagery of the body. And if you look at like Microsoft teams, if you look at that, they would have put where the wounds of the body would have sat. And that probably gives a better three dimensional aspect of the wounds that would have hit the body. Now, if you look closely, the legs, the the legs took a lot of hit. Oh, man. But the front yeah, of the see, arms, I was wondering, because you can see this, like I hadn't looked at this picture in advance, but you, uh, you could see all these little strikes all over the body. And I was yes. wondering what they were from. That is considered part of the flogging. So that's okay. where the lashes would have came down. Because I don't know what the length of those lashes would have been or the length of man, the They got to be long. Uh, let's look it up. How long? I know people. It looks hear me like typing. it's on the front of him and everything. Yeah. Where the everyone probably listens to a podcast goes. I wish he would just look this stuff up before the podcast. I don't <laughs> think about it, people. Listen, there's too much. Uh, listen, everyone. He don't know what I'm gonna say to him in advance, so he can't prepare <laughs> like that. Uh, I wish I did, man. That is interesting to know, though. Actually, I've got a lot of really, I would say, fun facts or not really fun facts, but things that I didn't necessarily know until I looked a lot of the stuff up. I think when it's in relation to the story, it's a lot of unpleasant facts or unfun facts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the links of the whip, specifically the flagrum, which is what we're talking about, or the mm-hmm, scourge mm-hmm. Yeah. used in the Roman scourging varied, but they were typically designed to be both effective and brutal. The exact dimensions of these whips were not precisely documented in historical texts, but based on archaeological finds, the historical understanding, we can draw some good conclusions. The flagrum structure, uh, which typically had pieces of bone, metal, or lead balls, which were intended to increase the severity of the wounds inflicted. Hmm. The leather thongs, the leather thong of the flagrum was likely the length that allowed for the most torture to strike. Typically, the acknowledged suggestion for the strands may have been between one and two foot, approximately 30 to 60 centimeters Hmm. long. So, Hmm. I mean, two foot, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a decent little, and you figure they're right up on top of you. You're kneeled down. Yeah. Not only that, yeah, okay. but it wasn't just straight up and down. It was they was sideways yeah. too because they was putting every the maximum force. Yeah, yeah. Uh, variation in design. It's important to note that these were there were likely variations to the designs. These scourges, depending on the specific use, the region, and the preference of the Roman authorities or executors, some might have sli- had slightly longer or shorter, and the number of strands in the material used for the tip could vary. Very crazy, the things that they did back then. Like, I couldn't even mm. imagine. Oh, well, yeah. It, it's not a ton of time between barbarism and civilization, so. Correct. It's you a know. whole lot shorter than what it was just becoming a society, if you think about it. Right. The time frame difference. It's one of those things where I sit there like, and maybe I'm just too far removed or too far advanced in, I guess, knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't imagine doing this to anyone without a purpose. And even then, I couldn't even imagine this level of torture to another individual. Do you you ever listen to like true crime stories though? Mm -hmm. All the time. There, There are people out there that, think that is fun but usually you don't get a whole group of them at once i think this is this is great this is a good good sunday night well and i they say it all the time different strokes for different folks um Mm. but it's still very crazy to me that an individual could be like "Eh, it's i guess it's saturday (laughs) let's go flog someone for funsies 
because yeah. they got and into let's it. Let's bring the kids and let's bring stuff right. to throw at them. And, you know, we're going to holler hateful things at them while this is happening to them. Correct. I don't know, man. It blows my mind that this was even an option. But again, mm-hmm. you know, we talk about the Romans. This one wasn't a Roman thing in this case, but mm. they certainly wasn't innocent in flogging people. They did it. A lot of times, I think a lot of people got flogged that shouldn't have necessarily been flogged. Right. Based on things I've read, like a lot of times it just came down to, you don't like Pilate? Well, you're getting a flogging today, mm. boy. Mm. Yep. Yeah. But the rest Even of your family after want, want to follow him. Yeah. So. It's, you know what? When you get a lot of people together, some really terrible stuff can happen. Like, I don't know what this was from, but there's something I heard that has always stuck with me. And it's a person is good. People are evil. Well, and I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, right? When we talk about Mm. our biggest fear of aliens coming down is that they're just going to mass kill everything. Right. And I said, we project it. (laughs) We project it. Mm -hmm. The us as a civilization, we believe because of things that we've done and things that we know we would do again, Mm -hmm. like no one's ever conquered land without bloodshed. It's probably the number one thing with the exception of religious beliefs Mm -hmm. that's killed the bulk of the, the, the people. Yeah. Well, I right. mean, we we all go through it. Each society has their violent, horrible times, and in the part in Demons the world in the now, you know, there's people at different stages of their societal evolutions that are doing now what we're ashamed of hundreds, oh, for sure, thousands of years ago, for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. even if you look at uh, as crazy as this sounds. And I'm sure you've seen this completely off topic, but kind of relevant. Mm. Have you seen these chimpanzees that are now using acts of warfare against other chimpanzees? I've heard of that. Yeah. They now climb to the top of trees and scout out positions before they attack them pre premeditated. Oh man, if we're not heading towards planet of the apes, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. How crazy is that? Like that's warfare we did a long time ago. We figured out, let's get an elevated spot, right? Satellites Mm -hmm. and imagery and airplanes. And they're doing it from the top of trees, looking down and they're determining before these apes go into war with each other, they're scouting each other out, which is crazy Mm to me. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, we've done that in the past too. They're at their stage of society where that's the thing. Correct. Super interesting. Mm-hmm. Completely off topic, oh, yeah. but totally oh, yeah. interesting. <laughs> Jesus well, to apes. It, it, I, this is how we get there. It, it's it's kind of on topic because whatever a large group of people or apes think is or normal apes. at the time <laughs> it is what it is. So back then, like us going to the movies is like them going to a public execution and, and, and scourging. <laughs> that is valid. Doesn't make it right, but that's where we are. Oh, yeah. Definitely doesn't make it right. So, obviously, that covered one of the big things. And we didn't know the severity of a lot of this until recent Mm. years is what I'm going to call this. It wasn't until we started doing archaeological digs that we're like, wow, okay, that's what these weapons were. So, to, Mm. to depict this on this shroud, it would have had to have been depicted a long time ago because we didn't know necessarily because at this point in time, the Romans were not doing that stuff in the 1500s. So I would call that one point in the, even if they wouldn't have put that in the shroud like that, if they were trying Mm -hmm. to fake a Jesus kind of deal. Right. Not saying this is Jesus. We've technically not proven anything with the exception of potentially the blood around the head. But Mm -hmm. the next segment we're going to go into, uh, it definitely kind of leans in that direction too. Are you ready for the next one, Nick? Yeah, I'm waiting for something in particular. So let's get to it. (laughs) Let's see if this is it.
The crucifixion of Jesus, a central event in the Christian narrative, is often depicted with nails driven through the palms. Yet, the Shroud of Turin, we see marks not in the palms, but through the wrists, a detail that aligns with modern understandings of Roman crucifixion methods. The Shroud reveals a clear image of wounds through the wrist area. This is significant, as archaeological findings and historical research suggest that crucifixion typically involved nails being driven through the wrist. The wrists could support the weight of a body more effectively than the palms, making this method more structurally sound for the purpose of crucifixion. In John's Gospel, Thomas Doubt is addressed with a reference to the nail marks. John 20:25. 20, so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. The original Greek word used for hands here is chair, which can refer to the entire hand, including the wrist. This linguistic nuance offers a subtle but important correlation with the shroud's depiction. The positioning of the wounds on the wrists in the shroud carries both a physical and symbolic weight. Physically, it suggests a more historically and anatomically accurate portrayal of crucifixion. Symbolically, these wounds represent the profound suffering and sacrifice that are central to the Christian understanding of the crucifixion. The Shroud of Turin, with its wrist wounds, contributes to a deeper understanding of the crucifixion. It challenges traditional artistic depictions and invites us to reconsider our visualizations of this pivotal moment. The Shroud, in its silent testimony, bridges the gap between faith, history, and science. In the marks of nails through the wrists on the Shroud of Turin, we find a poignant convergence of scriptural narrative, archaeological evidence, and historical authenticity. That's what I was waiting for. That one I kind there. of figured it was that one or the, I believe the next one is coming up. I figured it's one of the All last right. three. Yeah, I'm going to go on a little tirade about this one because mm -hmm. this is the one that really, when I first heard it, I'm like, oh, yeah, who would have thought to do this if you were faking it, right? Mm -hmm. Because crucifixions were, I think, a long time gone by the time this was quote unquote discovered right and all from that time forward every depiction is the hands and when i was a kid and everything every depiction was through the hands every painting everything and that was the common knowledge it was through the hands not possible because it wouldn't hold the weight and even if you think of the common perception of it because if you think of the phenomenon of stigmata, mm -hmm. it's always the hands, you know? And I don't know how much I believe in that, but when you get the stigmata and it's coming from your hands, and then we find out later that that wouldn't make sense, that makes me think, oh, it's more of a mind thing mm -hmm. when it's through the hands. But then now in the modern era, we're like, oh, it must have been done like this. And then we have something from way back when that, corrob that collaborates with modern knowledge. All this time, it wouldn't have. But then when we get the science, it says, yeah, that's how it was. And how did they know to put that on there if it wasn't so? Do you this know is why the one. Most... No, go See, ahead. That, I would say... Th See, the last one, the scourging and stuff like that, they didn't know. They didn't necessarily know how all that was supposed to be depicted either. Mm. This one, but do you know why the artists always put the, the nails in the hands? Why? It's because the translation from the Latin and the Greek. Mm. So the original, if you look at the biblical reference, the hand is considered all the way down to here. Right. This was all hand. So everything from the about midway through your wrist up was considered mm. your hand. When that's yeah, translated. Yeah, it said that in the narrative. Hand, so yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So, yeah. I definitely wanted to add that because if we just say the hand, which is biblical, you're like, mm. well, you're saying wrist here for the shroud, but his hand is because biblical reference, if you look at the original the original Greek or the Latin or, you know, mm. whatever it is, 
the Arabic, I believe, also went into this pretty heavy, but it's always from the mid wrist all the way up. So the strongest part of your body is right there in that metatarsal mm-hmm. is right there in your wrist. And uh, out of curiosity, do you know how long they typically hung on these crosses, Nick? Uh, I don't. I thought it was just like till death. So typically they, yes and no. Some people Mm -hmm. lived and they only left them out for so long, but they had a method of how to kill them when they took them off the cross or how to guarantee they were dead. We'll get into that. Uh, But if you look at the original uh, in biblical reference, we're going to go to Jesus, Jesus's biblical reference. The mm-hmm. time Jesus spent on the cross varies in the interpretation, but the general belief is to be approximately six hours. Oh, that's it. That's it. Yeah. So oh, according okay. to the gospel of Mark, the crucifixion begun on the third hour, which would have been mm. 9 a.m. And Jesus would have died um, at the ninth hour, which would have been 3 p.m. Mm. A lot of movies and stuff, they almost give the impression he was there for days. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, and, and I said, like, that's six. it. Like, it's no big deal. It's still a yeah. big deal. But it's no, not I like, mean, oh, that's it. I could do that. <laughs> yeah, these these people were suffering in the heat. Mm, right. For six hours. Um, but yeah, it was supposedly six hours for him. That was relatively common. So. You know, I think they, in some cases, from what I've read, they've left some bodies on there for longer, Mm. but they did one thing to every single person when they pulled them off the cross. If they were still alive, it killed them. Mm -hmm. If they were dead, they still did it to make sure the person was truly dead. Right. Uh, Which we'll get into that going forward. Okay. Okay. But yeah, um, historically, Romans used nails for the crucifixions and it was driven in the wrists. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was either in the ankles or the feet, depending on how the cross was made. Now, another interesting thing, I say interesting, a a horrible thing, but Mm -hmm. do you know how big the crosses were? No, no idea about that. The depictions is they're like 13, 20 foot tall and they're hanging all the way up in the air. Right, right. right. That's not true at all. I found this fascinating. Now, now I had heard they were also more like X's than they were T's a lot of the times as well. Is that something you found or? Yes and no. It was both. Mm. Um, I don't know that one was more prevalent than the others. Um, and a lot of people, they would hang, you know, in different ways. So prime example, the X would have been one way they hung some people upside down. Mm, that would, I would not want that one. Yeah. Peter technically asked to be hung upside down when he was captured by the Romans because he didn't find himself worthy enough to hang the same way Christ did. So he said, hang oh, wow. me upside down. I'm not worthy. So they hung him upside down. Mm. And think about it, your body weight, the blood rushing to your head. Yeah, not, that, not a good way to go. Crazy. No, uh, but they, the interesting thing is the size of the cross, the exact size of the cross is not technically detailed in the Gospels, mm-hmm. but based on historical practices of the Roman uh, um, crucifixion, the vertical stake. Uh, would have been mm-hmm. six foot nine inches. Okay, they're not right to nine foot. So six to okay. nine, six six point nine to nine. So almost seven foot to nine foot. Right. Uh, which is the equivalent of uh, two point one to two point seven meters high. Mm-hmm. And the horizontal beam would have been between five and six foot. Okay. Not quite as large as I picture in my. In my no, head, because <laughs> when someone tells me uh, they hung them across, I always get this imagery that they're like 20 foot up and they're walking up ladders mm. and everything else to get them up there. Right. 
Well, that's because how it's been depicted. Correct. I've seen a lot of but, that. Yeah. But here, we're a reputable podcast company. Listen, we're that's putting right. we're piecing some things together. But yeah, I thought that was interesting. That was not truly depicted. Hmm. Um trying to look and see if there's anything else that would have nah I think that's the biggies that has to do with the cross anyway but you know when you look at everything you go how in the world how in the world could an artist who and if you look at every artist of the time period like what you're talking about they put all Mm -hmm. the nails in the hands yeah and that someone must should have figured it out that there's nothing there's no bones in the hand that that join together that will prevent a nail pulling through, right? I think a lot but, of times, again, they looked at the Bible as the gospel. They had a translation mm-hmm. and they said, well, if that's how it is, that's how it is. Yeah. Plus, like I said earlier, the crucifixion had gone out a long time before this was discovered, I believe. It's like us trying to explain dial-up to our kids. Right. You had to do what? It went through your telephone? Like, what does that, that have doesn't to do make with sense. internet? That doesn't make any sense, right? And that's only been 30 years? Right. The The opposite is true, too. Back when, before I went to university, I had dial-up and I had no idea about cable internet. <laughs> yeah. And a friend of mine in the city I was moving to said they had internet through their cable. And I was like, what are you talking about? How you do that that's, and watch TV at the same thing. time? I said, I, I was like, you don't know how things work. That's not how that works. <laughs> Isn't it crazy though? I it's know. crazy to think about. Oh yeah. I was dumb too. I could like, well, I couldn't look it up. I had dial up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dial up. It took you three days to look it yeah, up. Uh, yeah. I, re- I remember uh, going away for a weekend and I started doom downloading on my computer when I left <laughs> and it wasn't done when I came back at the end of the weekend. Man. I never in my life illegally downloaded anything from Napster mm. ever. Good thing. Good thing, you bad boy. Um, but I heard rumors that sometimes mm. for like 10 songs, it would take you like an entire day. <laughs> I have no doubt whatsoever. <laughs> Which is crazy. Da- downloading a full album back in those days was unimaginable. Oh, yeah. So it's yeah. insane. So uh, times fact, have changed. <laughs> I didn't even have, uh, when I first started, there was like this thing that I plugged into my TV. Mm-hmm. I forget what the heck it was called. Uh, but you would hook your phone cable into it mm-hmm. and you would actually do the internet through your, through your TV. Oh, wow. Yeah. I forget what it was called. Right. I even bought my mom one when, when she first started on the internet, yeah. I was like, Hey, check this out. And that's how she connected to the internet. That's how I connected. It all started on TV. It wasn't until years later I got a computer and started doing it on the computer. Man, crazy. So so if this if this is how much we misunderstood from a couple decades. Correct. Now imagine how much we understand about something that was two thousand odd years ago. Correct. Like probably not a good understanding. No, I mean, and you know, these artists, they based a lot of things based on what they thought was Mm. occurring. And a lot of them would look at the biblical depiction and go, yep, that's what I'm drawing today. Yep. It's just kind of hard to, to really fight that, that concept when you think about it. Right. And and circling back, that's what makes this so amazing to me that I don't think a faker would have known to do that. No, absolutely not. It would not have been, if anything, something that they would have thought to do. I believe like everyone else that drew pictures of, you know, Jesus hanging on the cross, it would have been through Mm -hmm. the hands. And I, you Mm -hmm. can't tell me that all these artists after that would have depicted it that way. And this one artist just happened to get it right. Yeah. He's like, no, I don't like that. Yeah. I'm doing it different. <laughs> Let's do the wrist this time. No one's yeah. done that. Yeah. Uh the the next one is also depicted in the shroud and it's the only case 
where this has ever been documented as happening. This is the other thing that I thought you might've uh, been talking about. This is by process of elimination. I know exactly what this was and it spawns another legend. Yes. Are yep. you ready for okay. this one, Nick? I'm ready for this mystical one. Among the myriad marks of suffering on the Shroud of Turin, one wound stands out with poignant clarity. It is the side wound, a stark and vivid testament to a crucial moment in the Passion of Christ as narrated in the Gospel of John. John 1934 Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. In John's Gospel, the piercing of Jesus' side by a Roman soldier is a moment laden with theological significance. It is seen as a fulfillment of prophecy and a symbolic act representing the outpouring of grace from Christ. The flow of blood and water has been interpreted as symbolizing the sacraments of the Eucharist and baptism, central elements of Christian faith. On the shroud, this side wound is prominently visible. Located near the ribcage, the wound appears as a clear, elliptical mark. This corresponds with the type of injury that would be inflicted by a Roman spear. The size and shape of the wound on the shroud are consistent with what one would expect from a spear thrust designed to ensure death without a need for breaking the legs. The physical realism of this wound on the shroud is striking. It speaks to the brutality of the act and the historical realities of Roman execution methods. Symbolically, the wound represents the ultimate sacrifice, the piercing of the heart of the Son of God. It is a visual representation of the depth of suffering endured. The solemn imagery of the side wound on the Shroud of Turin, we find a powerful convergence of the gospel narrative with a tangible, historical artifact. This wound, silent yet eloquent, speaks across centuries, a testament to the enduring narrative of sacrifice and redemption at the heart of the Christian faith. So, what, what was this water business? What, what does it believe that it was? Yeah, so literally water came out along with the blood, or...? Is this so like a euphemism or no, well, potentially there's theories. Mm -hmm. Um, no one truly knows. So the the spear, and we reference this all the time as a spear mm -hmm. of destiny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So the spear of destiny, those spears were, I think, six to eight foot long. They were typically used for war, is what they were mm -hmm. used for. And the end of it, if you've never seen one, I would suggest people go look at these spears. They've got uh, ones that they've recreated that is similar to, but what they believe, everyone just talks about him getting stabbed in the side. That's not technically what they believe occurred. When you're shoving it up, the goal was to go underneath the rib cage and into the heart. Mm -hmm. Right. So you've got your, what is it? Uh, periocardial sac is that what mm -hmm. it's called around the heart I believe so when you're dying that brings a fluid that's uh, viscous or like uh, um, it's very water like when you're okay, dying so it, it would appear that water was coming out as well maybe that's that's the theory um, mm. and the body creates it, it kind of occurs when you're dying. Like right. a, a lot of times I'll talk about fluid in the lungs and they pump that fluid out. Mm -hmm, and it's, mm -hmm. it's like a thick water. Yeah. That's kind of the same thing, but it's all based on that sack around the heart. I think that's called a, I don't want to say it cause I could be wrong on that. I think it's periocardial. SAC, I think is what it's called. I'm probably okay. saying that there's some medical person. I, I've heard going, that term. Idiot. I've heard that term before. So yeah, but I don't know if I'm using that is something else. I feel like that's right. I'm, I'm going to look it up because I, okay. there's some medical person that's probably screaming at me right now going, you idiot. That's not what it is. Um, well, what, what kind of podcast you think you're watching here? The same <laughs> uh, uh, Jesus, Dr. MD here. <laughs> The fibro sac called the periocardium. So there you go. Heart. Yep. There Boom. You go. Listen in your face, yeah. medical people. Heck yeah. Yeah. Um, um, 
on here it says uh, the sac has two thin layers of fluid between them. The fluid mm. reduces friction as the two layers rub against each other and the heart beats. Mm. Normally, the sac is thin and flexible, but repeated inflammation can cause the sac to become stiff and thick. So I, there's I've, already a fluid there, obviously. Yeah. I feel like this was like a mystical thing, meant to be a mystical thing, though. I don't, I don't think they'd mention it if it was just like a little bit of liquid that was pretty normal. I think this was meant as some kind of, you know, like a purity thing or something like that, or like water pouring out I, along with the blood. I don't think so. No, you think it was like literally. Because it, it was symbolic. That was symbolic. Mm. That was a uh, prophecy is what that was. Okay. Because that's the only, that's the only way they killed Jesus. Right. But everyone you, else, I, moved, I mean the water part. That's what I'm getting to. Like, oh, okay. So okay. everyone else, when they pulled him off the cross, they did what? Uh, to make sure they were dead. I might have missed that part unless it was the break in the legs part or whatever. They, they broke everyone's legs. Right. Um, I believe that because if you just say, Hey, this guy tapped Jesus in the side with the spear to make sure he's dead. Mm. There's no way you can prove he's dead by doing that. But the fact that he, they would have pierced into his heart and all that would have seeped out would have been blood. And then this liquid, or they called it a water Mm that's symbolic that he hit his heart. You're going to okay. bleed. You're going to bleed regardless if he stabs right. you. But you're not going to have water. And they knew that back then unless you hit that heart. Right. That's the symbolism, uh, I believe, in that. Yeah, I, I guess that's the gap again. Is that that might have been common knowledge for them, but I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, like even if you look at, um, like I wouldn't know that if it wasn't for the fact that I've researched this in the past. So it's not like I'm some right. type of super genius. That's not right. You've if you've a lot of you, hearts lately, <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> but like, if you go back and you look at like apologetics, the people that, uh, they right. argue this kind of stuff. The first thing they talk about is back then it would have been common knowledge mm. that if you would have pierced through to the heart, a fluid would come out like a, almost like a mucus or like a thin water oh, membrane. Okay. It's not water, but it's, it basically would make blood can trickle down. When you add this fluid, it flows. Oh, okay. So it would have been a way of them going. Yeah. So when you look at biblical accounts, I think it's the, see, now I'm going to get everyone else mad at me. Uh, Don't, Mm. don't quote me on this. I believe it was John himself that says, and not, how does he phrase this? It's something along the lines of, and this man is going to have no broken bones. So it was prophesied that the Mm. man that dies for our sins will have no broken bone. So when they crucified him and they did not break his legs, Mm -hmm. they pierced up that, that was prophecy technically. What, why can't they just ever say anything plainly? Like it would (laughs) suffice, it would suffice to say he stabbed him and killed him. Like, you don't need to give that water detail and let people infer that if they have the knowledge. Just like, he stabbed him and killed him. That's enough. That's all you got to say. Valid. That's valid. Like, don't hint to it. <laughs> just, you, you, you killed him. I think what they was looking at in that, in that case was, mm. I stabbed him so hard. Right. That it went to what they may not have even, like, I'm sure they had a name for the heart. Right. But they just viewed it as it went so deep. Because think about it. If you're stabbing up, your rib cage is here. Your heart's, you know, a good foot. That's a good foot up. Mm. And, you know, uh, again, we don't think in these terms. But if you're a Roman soldier, like, you know, all the ways to kill a man 50 times. Yeah. Times 50. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, So they would have known how deep to shove this, this spear. You know, all of these things. And it was very crazy that this was the one way that they killed him versus everyone else that they crucified. Mm. And what makes this interesting is if you look at the pictures of this shroud, I don't know if you've ever had a broken bone. Technically, for those of you watching, Mm. 
you can see I've had my nose broken about 12 times. I have a deviated septum. You can see imperfections wow. when a bro- bone is broken. If you look at the shroud, everything is symmetrical. If he would have had a broken leg, it would not have looked like this or two broken legs. Mm. It probably would not be symmetrical like this. Right. So again, the actually shroud has, in, in the pose that he was in when the shroud was upon him, I don't think a broken le- leg would have supported the legs up like that. Cause they're sort of bent upwards. We're, we're going to get to that. Oh, okay. Okay. Jumping too far ahead. <laughs> well, I don't cover it in the narration, but it goes okay. into another hypothesis I have where mm-hmm. I'm about to blow everyone's mind at the end. Okay. Interesting. But you are correct in your thought process. But think about it. If if a let's use for example, if his body was laying completely flat. Mm-hmm. If his body was completely flat, the linens were loose. They weren't super tight against the body. If right. you have a broken limb, your leg is just going to be like jello. Right. It's not going to be perfectly lined up. Even if they try to line it up, it's not going to be mm. perfectly. Yeah. Plus, straight. he would like have ended up with two of them, right? It wouldn't just be a broken leg. They would have two broken two legs. With them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that would be noticeable. Yeah. And then if you look at the picture also on the side, mm-hmm. you can see there is a spear wound in that also. Hmm. Which is crazy when you, when you think about the fact that those two things alone. And the other thing that we didn't really cover, if you look at the, uh, the uh, depictions of the uh, the one black and white one. Mm-hmm. I guess it's more like a purple, but that last one that I sent you with the front and the back. If you look, yeah. there's not a lot of those whip marks on the torso, uh, like the the chest and the stomach, because the whip wasn't mm-hmm. that long, so it wasn't stretching all the right. way to the front. Yeah, that that's kind of what was misleading about um, the Microsoft Teams one. Yeah, so that looks like it's all over the front. Yeah. Which is definitely hitting like the uh the the arms and stuff. And th- mm. there's not really a good image of the chest. You can probably see some and probably like the side of the chest where it probably still would have hit. Mm. But there's always gonna be some I what I would call artistic interpretation, I'm assuming. Yeah. But still very interesting when you when you think about it in the grand scheme of things. Uh, the very next one, Nick, that we're going to go mm-hmm. over is one that I feel like. And I'm just double checking to make sure that I'm speaking correctly here. Um, yeah, the next one covers something that people only graze over. Okay. I feel like they don't give it its its amount of due. Are you ready to hear that one? Yeah, let's hear that. I'm curious. In the Gospel of John, a single line paints a vivid picture of endurance and suffering. John 19:17, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull. This imagery of Jesus bearing the cross to Golgotha is a powerful symbol of the burden of the crucifixion. The act of carrying the cross in the Gospels is laden with symbolic and literal weight. It is an embodiment of the physical and spiritual burden that Jesus is portrayed as bearing for humanity. On the Shroud of Turin, we find echoes of this biblical narrative. The cloth shows clear signs of abrasions on both shoulders. These are not mere marks, they tell a story of a body that has borne a significant load. The positioning and nature of these abrasions suggest the friction and pressure of carrying a heavy object, such as a wooden cross. The realism of these marks on the shroud is striking. They provide a physical testament to the account of the Gospels. The abrasions indicate a journey, one filled with pain and struggle, as the bearer of the cross makes his way to the place of his execution. The shoulder abrasions on the Shroud of Turin offer a tangible connection to the Passion narrative. They serve as a stark reminder of the physical realities of the crucifixion, while also symbolizing the profound spiritual dimensions of Jesus' journey to Golgotha. Hmm. Now, now, was that common? Something. What's that? That they had to carry their own uh, cross? Yeah. Uh, so, again, this is 
movies depict this incorrectly. I've only seen mm-hmm. a few movies that do, do this correctly. No one could carry the cross in and of itself by themselves. Okay. Uh, the cross is weighed like 300 pounds. Mm. Um, and the, typically the distance that the, the people had to walk was not super far, but it's far enough to where you're not walking, dragging 300 pounds, especially after being flogged. Right. Right. So typically what they would do is the beam that their arms would be extended on. Mm-hmm. Typically they would carry that and their arms would be tied to it. Oh, okay. I feel um, like I, I have seen that depiction before somewhere. Maybe. Yeah. They, a lot of movies don't get it right. They show him carry, or even if you look at like no. illustrations, he's always carrying yeah. the cross. I'm like, he's not carrying that cross that far. It's 300 pounds. I've got it here in my facts somewhere. Um, hold on. Uh, yeah. So the weight of the cross, the entire cross in which Jesus was crucified, it estimated to weigh 300 pounds or 136 kilograms. However, it is widely believed that Jesus only carried the horizontal beam to the side of the crucifixion, uh, crucifixion, which would have weighed approximately 75 to 125 pounds. Okay. So when you look at that. And I'm looking at the back right now. So this thing mm-hmm. abrasions across the shoulders. Yep. If you look at the, the pictures don't do this a lot of justice. You got to kind of glance. You'll mm. see in the ones with the negatives, it almost looks like there's more white on the shoulders. I couldn't find a real good picture showing it. But like, if you look at the one that's both the front and the back, Yeah. You'll see that more white around the shoulder area and it almost looks denser. And I believe that's what they're referring back to. Okay. I I think my untrained eyes, I can't tell that, but I'll have to take their word for it. Yep. Um, There's better pictures of the shroud, but here's the tricky thing. It won't let you Mm. save it to your computer. Right. So I would say do a quick glance at uh the old internets when we get off and there's some way better pictures of this thing than what i've got here yeah because because i'm not confident with the nature of the 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 flailing they they did to his back Mm -hmm. i i i think the the extensive flailing could have done anything that i see here but Oh, I guess I'll, I'll, yeah, it, I'll defer to the experts for that, I guess. <laughs> I think what they're getting at is if you look at, because again, if you get a flogging, right? Mm. Blood's going to drip down. But if you look anywhere where there's a negative, there's like pools of it in the shoulder mm. area, which is what I believe they're trying to depict. So there's no reason there'd be a pulling of blood there. Because mm. okay. I believe what they're attempting to say. Okay, and I do see a lighter area. Yeah. On on one there's side better for pictures. sure, but Yeah, there's okay. better pictures. The ones I've got is not probably the best. And even those mm. that uh we'll be looking at these pictures after the fact, go and look at better pictures. Again, there's some pictures they won't let you save to the yeah. computer. Like when you looked at them, could you say could you say like, "Oh yeah, that's definitely what that is?" Or there's one picture where they actually zoomed into like the, I would say like top of the chest and the back. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was pretty, but again, that was an article talking about this specific thing. Right. I just, it was one of those where it saves it as a web, whatever. A web P W-E-B. file. Yeah. So obviously that's yeah. not going to work for what we're using it for. The smarty pants is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you just clip it. Use clip. I should have. Uh, I should have. You're right. I should have. <laughs> well, that that's okay. I get the idea there. Um I I don't see it, but I I'll take their word for it that that's there. Yeah. And definitely look after the podcast. Go take a glance yeah. at some of those better photos and what I've got and you'll see it. Okay. But even if you skip that part, like even yeah. if you say 
let's let's say it's not even there and you look at the rest hmm. of it. Um, I'm about to go to another one that again, I feel like people just kind of glance over it. They don't put a lot of thought into it. Mm-hmm. Are you ready for that one? Yes. The journey to Golgotha, as depicted in the traditional stations of the cross, is a path marked by suffering and human frailty. Among these stations, there are poignant moments where Jesus falls under the weight of the cross, a testament to the physical and emotional toll of his impending crucifixion. The stations of the cross, a devotional practice in Christian tradition, depict various stages of Jesus' journey on the day of his crucifixion. Gospel of Luke 23-26 As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. On the Shroud of Turin, we find subtle yet telling marks, abrasions on the knees. These marks align with the traditional depiction of Jesus falling while carrying the cross. The abrasions suggest contact with a hard surface, indicative of a fall or multiple falls. The knee abrasions on the shroud add a layer of realism to the depiction of the passion. They provide a physical dimension to the narrative, highlighting the human vulnerability of the figure portrayed on the shroud. These marks speak of a journey marred by pain and difficulty, resonating with the traditional images of Jesus' falls. Okay, now that one's a little more clear to me. I can see that... Yeah, so if you look at that picture 2008, Mm -hmm. you can see that right knee is significantly different colored. Almost like he would have fell or that would have been the dominant knee he would have fell to the most. Yeah. But even the other knee is as not quite as dark, but it's darker Mm -hmm. than the rest of the body. Yeah. Now that, that one's pretty clear, so I can take that one pretty yeah. easily so that uh, now, no sorry go ahead i was just gonna say nowhere in the bible nowhere and i know all the biblical scholars are gonna say it doesn't say in the bible that he ever fell and you're right it's you're correct in that but it is theorized theorized that he would have fell for one more than likely his hands was tied to the cross to the mm. top of the cross member for two. The man was just flogged 39 times. Right. He had blood loss already and he had to walk a distance for three. When you look at the grand scheme of everything, as said in the scripture, they made someone else pick up his cross. In that mm. case, it would have been the, the vertical and help him carry it. My right. guess is he couldn't do it no more. Yeah. They there wouldn't be no need otherwise. Yeah. They're like, let's not kill him till we get him up here. Right. We're never going to make it there. We want to watch him suffer. So in, in the narrative, it, it sounded like they forced that guy to do it. In other stories I've heard, he like volunteered to help or he just decided to help. Is it more like he was forced or? It's, it was basically yes and no. The people that was there that was walking beside him, that would have been someone that would have basically been like, a, in, in that occasion, someone that was probably a follower in some capacity is, mm. is those people. And they're like, fine, if that's your king, then you do it. Like right. they forced it to happen, mm-hmm. but he would have done it regardless is what the assumption right. is. I, I don't know if I was just imagining it wrong, but the narrative made me think this guy just got into town from somewhere. Like he had this long journey and they're like, Hey you. And he's like me. Kinda. And they're like, yeah, you got to carry this now. Kind of, but it was probably more along the lines of he was there. He, uh, he was basically not yeah, he necessarily came for that reason. Probably more. Uh, I don't know that he necessarily came for that reason. I, I I've always viewed it at, and I don't know. I always hmm. viewed it as in he just happened to be there. Right. He wasn't anti this is God. Hmm. And they was probably like, you poor person, go do this. Hmm. <laughs> but you know, like, I didn't I didn't do anything. I'm not a blast. Yeah, yeah, why are you making Pilot me do this? Pilot didn't make me do this. So 
Yeah, but I find that part of the story interesting because when you think about it, mm-hmm. and again, I hear a lot of people go, we're well, nowhere to save or falls on his knees. If it's you and you're just carrying that plank around, I could see where it'd be easy to fall. It's gravel mm-hmm. and dirt and grime and you're losing blood. First and foremost, yeah. you've just gotten flogged. You're in unbearable pain mm-hmm. already. I I think anyone would fall. I don't know that anyone would be capable of not falling at least a couple times, two or three times. Right. Well, I mean, given everything that we've seen about the Romans here, what makes anyone oh. think that they're like, uh, you know what, let's just do him a favor, get him some help here. No, he he literally couldn't do it anymore. That's the only reason they do that. Technically, mm-hmm. in their minds, <laughs> I don't think I put this in the narrative because I don't mm-hmm. think I thought it was relevant, but I find it kind of funny based on what you're telling me. Yeah. Before they would put, before they'd crucify anybody, mm-hmm. they would typically offer them a drink of wine mixed with two things. I think myrrh was one of them and something else. Okay. And the point of it was to try to reduce the amount of pain from them crucifying the person. Oh, geez. It was like an antiseptic kind of. Well, Cause why obviously even bother wine, at that point. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but know, I find it like, funny that they're like, we don't want you to suffer from this crucif, but we just flogged yeah, you 39 but, times. Yeah. But we got to put on a good show. So <laughs> <laughs> now the interesting part of the story is, mm-hmm. Not to go biblical, but it's kind of interesting. In typical fashion, they offered it to Jesus and Jesus refused it. Mm. Which is an interesting part of the narrative. They offered it to him. He refused to drink the wine. Yeah. Well, I, I guess he he needs to make a great sacrifice. So this is all part, part of the experience, I guess. Part of the core, yeah. Unfortunately. Mm. But just think about it from a from a person's perspective. Mm-hmm. If the story is true, mm-hmm. what a horrific way to die. Oh, for sure. Without a doubt. He hung there for six hours, according to mm-hmm. scripture. But then he dealt with the flogging, the mm-hmm. carrying of all this stuff. If there yeah. truly was a way to not go with the exception of this, I can only think of one other way and that's burning to death in a fire. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm but a even, ginger. So this crucifixion out in the sun would be equivalent <laughs> to that for me. Basically. So, yeah. So that'd be all basically. that on top of that. <laughs> now, a lot of times, you know, Christians will use these metaphors of all the things that he went through to mm-hmm. metaphorically bring it back to us. Mm. But I think it was just, honestly, it wasn't, I don't necessarily know that the things that he did was for the metaphor of what he was doing it for. I believe it was just the part of the torture of, unfortunately, this is the way life was. Right. And I think that's a more reasonable view of that kind of thing. Like a yes. lot of people had very similar experiences to this. In fact, I think there were historical references that I've heard where there were whole fields of people. Being oh, for crucified. sure. Actually, actually, during the slave revolt in Roman times, they had mm-hmm. hundreds of people crucified at once. There was so, tens of thousands. Yeah. Tens of thousands. That would just be like them doing it over the course of a very short time frame. Tens mm-hmm. of thousands. Yeah. So, so a lot of people went through this. This was something that was normal for the time, plus a couple bonus features that he got that others didn't probably. So, and when I say bonus, it's in the most gory and gruesome of terms, of course, but. Oh, for sure. Like I say, this is definitely not the way if I had to choose that I would want to go out. Hmm. So, so those, so the stabbing was that a mercy from Longinus, like the soldier with a spear? As was that a mercy? As, you know, again, there's different theories that go around this. The number one theory is it was predestined. It was mm. 
because the person that was supposed to be the Godhead or stand, uh, sits at the right hand of God had mm-hmm. no broken bones when it occurred. Right. So it was supposed to have been predestined. Now, why he, he speared up into the body, there's no record of that. Mm. It was I, just, I hey, had this heard happened. Tellings of it, like he like felt bad for him and decided to do it. I don't know if I that's, don't know that that's biblical. Yeah. That might have just been something in a movie or something like that. I think it makes for a great story, but I don't believe that yeah. was why that was done. I don't believe so. I know that they had mercy on him when they gave him wine mm. because before he died, he asked for a drink and they put wine on a sponge. Right. And he drank of the sponge. Mm. Um, and that, so for most people that don't know, it was a vinegar wine. And that's typically what the soldiers would have carried. So the last mm. wine that Jesus would have drank, if the story is true, would have been probably from a soldier. And most people don't know that. Most people's like, well, one of his uh, disciples would have brought and gave it to him. Nope. That was common wine that would have been mm. carried by soldiers. That would have. So that was a soldier given mercy to him in that yeah. matter. Cause they didn't have to give him anything. You know, back in those days, very few people actually drank water at all. It was almost. They couldn't. They this, would have died. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's this. how they clean not- the water. Yeah, a, a kind of wine that was probably closer to, oh man, I hate to say it because this stuff is disgusting, but probably closer to kombucha like we have today right. is what they probably imagined. It was probably like gross. Well, a lot of times they say the wine wasn't fermented. Right. Or partially um, fermented sometimes. Partially, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was basically there to kill off any bacteria or anything that mm. was in the water. Come to find out, and I just found this somewhat off topic, and I apologize for this. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't know this, but a lot of kids in the 1940s, 1930s, 1940s on some of the farms Mm -hmm. also put a little bit of wine in their water. Oh, yeah? Or or alcohol, or just flat out alcohol to kill off whatever was in the water so it was safe to drink. I didn't know that, but that makes a lot of sense. It's interesting, uh, though, because I didn't know yeah. that either. I think I read that, of, of all places, <laughs> I think I read that in Uncle John's bathroom it's reader. Bathroom reader. A lot of good yeah. information in those books. A lot of good information. A lot of worthless knowledge, but I love it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I think it's the 1930s, 1940s. Uh, what would happen is when uh, they would put the thermoses, because kids would do labor back then, mm. they'd put a little bit of alcohol or wine in it to kill off whatever was in there. <laughs> yeah. Which is crazy when you think about it. Again, yeah, well, we take little things like what we have now for granted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can drink water anywhere I find it almost and be fine. You can buy that straw for like 30 bucks and you can yeah. drink right out of a pond. Yeah. Not to mention the immunizations we've gotten as children oh, protect yeah. us from a lot of that stuff too. So like we're Superman sure. compared to them. <laughs> we really are. <laughs> Except <gonna>. in fitness. <laughs> yeah, definitely not in fitness. That one, they no. really got us on that one. Yeah. Well, the next one kind of goes into another thing that I think is typically kind of glanced over a little bit too quickly. Okay. You want to hear that, Nick? Yeah, let's get into that. The Shroud of Turin, in its silent portrayal of suffering, hints at more than just the wounds of crucifixion. Closer examination reveals subtle indications of bruising and swelling, especially noticeable around the face. These markings align with the biblical narratives that speak of the physical abuse Jesus endured before his crucifixion. In the Gospel of John, there is a stark account of such abuse. John 18 and 22. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. This moment, along with other instances of mistreatment at the hands of Roman soldiers and temple guards, paints a picture of the physical ordeal Jesus faced. The subtle yet discernible signs of bruising and swelling on the shroud's image, particularly around the face, lend a physical dimension to these scriptural accounts. 
The markings suggest impacts consistent with being struck. They serve as silent testimony to a series of abuses that would have compounded the suffering already inflicted by the scourging and crucifixion. From a historical perspective, such treatment of prisoners, particularly those accused of serious crimes like blasphemy or insurrection, was not uncommon in Roman times. The bruises and swellings on the shroud, therefore, also provide a window into the brutal practices of ancient judicial systems. In the bruises and swellings marked on the Shroud of Turin, you know what's odd about that bit there is as soon as it said that and I'm looking at the picture, I saw on the face the swelling and I don't think I noticed it before, but it became super clear. You know what's funny is I always, mm. when I would look at this photo before anyone ever said that, mm -hmm. I always said, why does the face always look so fat? Mm. I just always thought the way the linen draped on the face, it just made him look like he had a fatter face because mm. I sit there and I think back then they would have had very thin faces. Right. And I'm like, if there's one thing that always looked off, the face always looked mm. abnormally large and almost fat. If, and it wasn't until I did research. If you're looking at the two sided image, the S A Y one, Mm -hmm. And you're looking at the left hand side and the left side of his face, it looks swollen under the eye. Right. In particular, like that's like a fat eye. Right. Yeah. And I don't know and how honestly, I never noticed that before. See, I've always noticed it, but I mm. didn't understand the logic until I did research for this podcast. I didn't piece that together ever. I just right. always thought he looked like he had a fatter face than what I assumed he would have had. Hmm. But then I'm like, I don't know what Jesus looked like. Maybe they all had fat faces back then. I just didn't yeah. know it. Uh, they, they've done some like modern constructions of what they suspect he would have looked like and stuff like that. Yes. Um, and I, I don't think it was, I don't think it was a fat face or anything like that, but that, that definitely no, looks like someone who's given, given, gotten, been given a bloody eye, like a, a, like a slap to the, near the eye. Now, they actually put the shroud into AI technology. Mm -hmm. There's a picture called Turin Shroud Reimagined by AI. And using AI technology, that's what the shroud said he would have looked like. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things that they talk about is based on AI's interpretation. Mm-hmm. They said that the way things sat would have been closer to what he would have looked like. So it would have been more likely he would have had more of like a goatee okay. kind of mustache with not as heavy of a beard as what they typically put out for him. Right. The hair was going down to just below where the shoulders are. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest of it. AI obviously can't get too descript because it doesn't, it's just basing it based on where things sit. Yeah. But definitely an interesting interpretation by AI. Hmm. Now, how close did he really look? Who knows? And is this really Jesus? Who knows? But this is who they say the shroud would have looked like. <laughs> that's how I'll put it. Yeah. I mean, that, that, <laughs> I guess the only, and this sounds like a weird complaint to have, but it looks mm -hmm. too much like I would expect him to look, if you get what it I'm saying. seems opposite for me, because yeah. I think everyone depicts it to be just a big old buff looking white guy. Mm. But this one, I feel, has more of like a, kind of like, a, I mean, let's be honest, he kind of looks a little bit, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. as someone who would have been in Nazareth. But I think they made the image. It's obviously in Sophia. Yeah. So I think if it was truly, they, they don't know skin color or anything like that. I don't know. He looks, <laughs> these are the impressions that I get. He looks like a nice guy. He looks like someone who would, <laughs> you know, like, I, I mean, I know it's Jesus and all. But if yeah. I saw this guy and he was talking to me, I like he looks really patient. He looks 
Like he's, <laughs> you know, he yeah. looks like a nice guy that I'd listen to what he had to say and I wouldn't expect him to rob me or anything. So, I mean, he looks like a decent sort of fella. I'd hate to see anything bad happen to him. When you I know? first looked at this photo and I yeah. hate to say this, I thought he kind of looked like, uh, uh, Manson a little bit. Dude, you have done it now. You thought people were going to get mad at you for other things. You just said Jesus <laughs> the way Manson. I'm saying the AI's interpretation kind of looked wow. like Charles Manson a little bit. That a little bit. It gave me that vibe. Super duper blasphemous. I listen, I didn't say Jesus looked like Charles Manson. I said the AI's interpretation kind of looked like Charles Manson. A little I, bit. I don't think so. I think this guy looks nice. You don't think this guy looks I, I didn't nice? Listen. I think he listen. He looks like someone I would go to Sunday school with. But yeah, I'd listen to what he has to say down by the river. <laughs> well, that's good because that's where he's doing most of his stuff. Yeah. Now exactly. there's a lot of theories. There's a lot of theories mm. in how the shroud was created. Sorry to, to interrupt you there. I actually, I look, look looking him in the eyes right now. I feel real bad for him. <laughs> is that AI anyway. Jesus, Nick? It's not the real is, one. No, this is this is my one now. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Go on. I'm sorry. I apologize. Oh my god. I just feel real bad oh for him. Oh my gosh, all. Nick. So there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of theories in how this shroud was created. Mm. Um. Do you want to hear the different theories? Yes, I Mine do. Mine is in here. Mine is in here, by the way. I'm going to let okay. you pick your favorite one. Yeah, I've kind of given you my theory, but let me hear these and then I'll re-choose, I guess. I know a thousand percent yours is wrong and we'll, we'll talk about why. Oh, okay. I think it was a good theory, but mm. I know something that you don't know, so. Oh, okay. I'll educate you. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> <laughs> The Shroud of Turin, throughout its storied history, has not only been an object of veneration but also of intense scrutiny and debate. If not a miraculous imprint, what then could explain the mysterious and haunting image on this ancient linen? Science, art, and history converge in the quest to unravel this mystery. One prevailing theory posits that the Shroud is a product of medieval artistry. Critics of the Shroud's authenticity often cite the radiocarbon dating tests from 1988, which dated the cloth to the medieval period. Proponents of this theory suggest that a skilled artist, possibly using techniques unknown today, created the image. However, this theory struggles to explain the image's detailed three-dimensionality and the lack of visible paint or pigment residues. Another hypothesis centers on a chemical reaction, possibly involving the oils and spices used in ancient burial practices. Some researchers propose that these substances could have reacted with the body's natural emissions, like sweat and gases, to create a stain on the linen. Critics of this theory argue that it fails to convincingly replicate the nuanced details and depth of the shroud's image. The revelation that the image on the shroud resembled a photographic negative led some to speculate about an early form of photography. This theory suggests that a primitive photographic technique involving light-sensitive substances and the body's exposure might have created the image. However, this theory is often disputed due to the complexity and anachronism of such a process in medieval times. A more recent and scientifically speculative theory suggests that some form of energy release, such as radiation, at the time of death could have created the image. Proponents of this idea often link it to the concept of the resurrection, proposing that a burst of radiant energy could have scorched the linen. This theory, while intriguing, remains largely in the realm of speculation and lacks substantial scientific backing. The image on the Shroud of Turin continues to be a subject of fascination and debate. From medieval artistry to chemical reactions, from early photography to radiant energy, the theories are as varied as they are intriguing. Each hypothesis offers a glimpse into the human endeavor to understand and explain the mysteries of our world. So I think you thought number four and I thought number two. Yes and no. Okay. 
So the reason yours is for sure that which Nick's was the would have been the oils that would have been used yeah. to um, process Jesus's body. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing. And this wasn't really covered in the narration because I didn't think you would come up with this theory. Okay. Um, if you look at the other side of the shroud, mm-hmm. the image is not seen. Mm. Wait, hold on. Say that mm-hmm. again. So the shroud is showing the front and the back. That's all one piece. I don't know if right. you knew that or not. Yeah, because I can if see you to flip, fold it over. If you flip the shroud around, yeah, there's nothing. Oh, okay. So it's like a canvas to a degree. Hmm. That's why a lot of times they say it was an artist's depiction. Right. Because the painter substance is only on one side. Okay. So and I, and I guess if it was seen, the oils would have seeped through all the way through is because it's a fabric. Why it wouldn't be that. Right. Okay. Also, let's use, for example, if you go upstairs and you put vegetable on your hand mm-hmm. and you put it down on a paper towel. Right. It's just going to be a hand. It's not going to have any of the dimensional stuff. Mm. Like there won't be thicker places where the oil is versus less thick areas. I think if you put oil all over your body Mm -hmm. and then you laid a sheet, something that's got a little bit of weight to it on top of you, there would be Mm -hmm. parts where it gets more saturated, where it's touching you more. And when it drapes down and away from your body, it would be less. So I think that could happen. But the thing about not being on the other side at all, that that's a problem. What I mean is like the spots where he got flogged. Mm. Those crevices. Yeah. I don't think oil would have got those. Yeah, probably not. Unless that part is blood as well. Like making the contrast there. Could be. But, Could be. but it you would have soaked right through. There. That's the part that you've got me on is it, it would would have soaked through, I would assume. I believe it's technically two of these at the same time. Okay. Now I'm going to explain my theory and I'm going to give you some information <sighs> that nobody knows. And I'm going to give you my theory on this also. Now. Okay. Everyone understand I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. So I'm going to probably have about this much, this much of a um, viewpoint based on what I'm going to say. But even science right now is a little confused. I'm going to talk about a different event for one second because I want you to think about this. Okay. When we dropped the first set of atomic bombs, Mm -hmm. do you remember those pictures from that? I I do. And I think I know where you're going to go with this. Like they found the shadows of the bodies and the imprints, correct? Yep. Correct. Science now has a theory that they believe that this was created by a source of energy. I don't think the photography thing is far off. Mm. but from a different perspective. Right. They're looking at it as in someone's trying to create a photograph. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the case. I believe that the reason that this is a three dimensional photo is because it was a three dimensional person. I want you to look at the Microsoft teams image again. Mm -hmm. There's a reason I put this in here. Okay. Look at the legs. Look at the head. Mm-hmm. That would never have looked like that. They laid them flat. Their bodies flat. Okay. When this was done. Now you may ask, well, why did they depict this like this? The, the way that the body is set up is based on the three dimensional view of what happened. Now, my theory is 
Mm-hmm. I can't explain it. I don't understand it. I think part of it comes from faith. I believe whatever this resurrection was, Jesus's body did not remain. It went somewhere. Now, okay. this is where sci-fi flips in a little bit. Mm-hmm. I don't think that God makes miracles happen. I think he uses whatever he already has to do whatever it is he needs to do. Like people talks about the big bang theory all the time. Mm-hmm. Well, God clearly didn't do it as a big bang. Who's to say God didn't use the big bang to create it to begin with. Yeah. Like the initiator of the big bang kind of thing. Yeah. yeah I've heard we people say that before. We don't know how anything's done. So what if much like the big bang, mm-hmm. now Jesus is transformed into microscopic atoms and at the same equivalent as an atomic bomb, using that much energy mm-hmm. to go through, it would have caused what happens when you have an atomic bomb. There's a bright flash, correct? Mm-hmm. The energy causes the shadows. Right. I believe he was resurrecting himself. He was coming back from the dead. That's why his legs are positioned. The other thing that's not talked about in the narration, you can see movement in the chest and the stomach area. Also in the 3D depiction, there's okay. a part in the, in the dimensions where it's elongated, but it almost looks like there's, there had to have been some type of movement. Hmm. Now, what they say is, well, clearly someone picked the body up and that's what caused that. Okay. I don't, again, that's not an oil thing. Hmm. So it doesn't matter what the body was, whatever caused that to happen. The only thing I can think is radiation, a bright source of light. And I believe there was movement in the body before whatever happened that made his body disappear. Okay. Now I do find it interesting that what's moving is his legs, supposedly his chest and his almost like uh, his midsection as -hmm. well as his head. Because doesn't that look like you if he's trying to get up in the morning? Yeah, I was thinking that. I was thinking that. Well, there'd be a lot more it's crying weird. involved. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird that his body was depicted in 3D movement, mm. three-dimensional movement, looking like me when I'm trying to get out of bed. This, this is a very, I got to say, this is a very intriguing theory. I like that and a this lot. This isn't me. Yeah. This this is science right now is saying the image is depicting this, mm. but we're not saying that's resurrection. Right. They're fighting in what it means, but they're mm. saying that there's definitely 3D dimensional depth. Right. But they're still saying there's a part of science, all of science technically saying it's false, except for Christian scientists right now is going. We don't know what it is. It's cl- mm. Everyone agrees there's three dimensions to it. Right. And there, these things are definitely being depicted as movement. Mm. But we don't know how. My other thing is, if you're creating art, you're typically not thinking of it three-dimensionally. And if you right. did it three-dimensionally, why would you do it like that? Mm. It's too much That makes no sense. Way too much forethought. For one, you're doing all the injuries that no one probably even knew. Mm -hmm. Because if this was done before 1500, how many Bibles was out that would have depicted this death? Right. Would you have had access to that? Very unlikely. And then you would have thought to add things like three dimensions to it. Hmm. That's a very odd thing to add. Yeah. This does make a very compelling case once you add it all together. Each individual thing, it's like, it's not really, like each individual thing is like, well, that's not really proof of anything. That's not really proof of anything. But it it gets a little harder to to naysay once you start adding it all together. And this last thing, which I've never heard before, is... It's really compelling. I don't know if I can say I believe it. However, Mm -hmm. just because of the kind of podcast we're on and the weird beliefs I have, 
I want to believe this. Mm. Mm. I do like this theory. I do like this theory. Now, here's the thing. If you mm-hmm. look at the one that says resize and you look at the Microsoft team ones, those are two different depictions of the same thing by two different people that redepicted the body. Mm. They're not the same. But when you look at them, they both have the same depiction of the same 3D modeling of the same parts of the body. Yeah. Very similar characteristics. Very similar characteristics. Yeah. I think the the In Microsoft them, Teams one illustrates it better almost because it does look like he's like getting up. I feel like it's more exaggerated when you look at the other one, it's a little less exaggerated. Yeah. But in the same regard, the fact that they both have an exaggeration in the legs, almost as though it's getting up and they both have the head means mm. that there's clearly three dimensions there that they can go. That's definitely three dimensional based on what we can see. Mm. And this is where the stress lines would have been. Which again, is an interesting way to look at it. That is interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to have to stew on that a bit more, but I, I expect not, you to. Yeah. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm very interested in this. I'll take a pamphlet. <laughs> I feel like, and again, I feel like everyone's going to say, why would he do a two parter on the shroud? Not a lot of people cover all aspects of the shroud. Mm. I feel like they pick and choose what they like. And I yeah. left out double the information. Now mm. I've tried to cover some of it as we've gone, but I'm sure I've forgotten some things that, you know, unfortunately was a little bit uh, beyond my memory. No, I th- I think this is good because you've come up with stuff that I hadn't heard before. And I have extensively read and listened and watched things about this. And this, it's this last thing. Yeah. And this, and this last part is really what rounded it out for me. Kind of gives a, a new perspective on things. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. It sure does. Because I did go a fair amount of my life as a believer. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even have this information. So if I got this information back then, I would just be like, well, duh, clearly this is how it happened. You know, I wouldn't have even thought, I wouldn't doubt this at all. Right. So even it, if you, yeah. if my thing is, is, if you take religion completely out of it and you just look at it for what it's worth, mm. you say this isn't about damnation or going to heaven or any of that stuff. Mm. You look at the unsolved mystery part of it. I think everyone would have to say there's something to this. No differently than Dorothy Edie for me is very not biblical for me, mm-hmm. but I have to go. I don't understand it. There's something to yeah. it. And that was my story. Yeah. There, there is something this one's to the this. Same way. <sighs> Even putting all this aside in the mystical stuff, I really mm-hmm. don't feel like they have given us any good alternatives to how this was made. Like if it's I've not this s- stuff, then what is it? Well, the next segment I've got goes into the skepticism part of it. Okay. You kind of heard, heard a piece of it, which this yeah. is why I put the fire part in earlier. Right. When they carbon dated this shroud, it went back to around the time that they did the repairs and come to find out when they looked yes. at where they cut, they cut on yeah. a section that was repaired. You know what? I know there's real scientists are really smart, but that was stupid. I think they must have known they this should too. have not acknowledged it. I mean, I would assume they would have acknowledged it, but I wasn't there. So, I mean, maybe yeah. it looks closer than what it is. Do you want to hear the skeptics part? Maybe that'll switch your decision back around. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying this is magic. I didn't say you was saying. I'm, I'm saying, just saying you're leaning that way a little bit. I that am, is possible. My gears are turning and I need to, I need to think <laughs> more about this. I can't commit. Part. I can't commit. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, but That's yeah, fair. let's let's see. I well, I'll t- I'll give you this much. I don't think the skeptical part mm-hmm. is going to make me any more skeptical. Might be surprised. I listen. Oh. I did not look at this from a. I I didn't hold any punches on either side. You know, you know what really won me over. 
It's how nice Jesus looked. <laughs> I'm having a hard time doubting him because he looks so friendly in the thing that AI made. That I'm kind of like, I don't want to disappoint AI Jesus. So, I mean, I feel but, you. Listen, but, he's yeah. a nice looking guy. Yeah, like super friendly I, looking. This, yeah, and well, you think he looks like Manson, but I think he looks I mean, real nice. That was the first thought that came through my yeah. mind. So. You can play this skeptic part, but I'm really not here to let AI Jesus down. So I don't know, man. Let's see what the skeptics say. Maybe maybe okay. it will lean you in a different direction. Yeah, I don't see. think I can do that to AI Jesus, but okay. The Shroud of Turin, an artifact shrouded in mystery and reverence, has also been a focal point of skepticism and scientific scrutiny. For those who approach the Shroud from a skeptical standpoint, questions abound, and definitive answers seem elusive. Central to the skeptic's view is the radiocarbon dating conducted in 1988. These tests, carried out by three independent laboratories, dated the linen to the medieval period, specifically between 1260 and 1390. For skeptics, this dating is a strong indicator that the shroud is a medieval creation rather than a relic from the time of Christ. Skeptics also point to inconsistencies in the historical record. The first undisputed mention of the shroud only appears in the 14th century. For a relic purported to be from the time of Jesus, this late appearance raises questions. Skeptics argue that if the shroud were genuinely from the era of Christ, it would likely have been mentioned in earlier historical or religious texts. Further fueling skepticism is the absence of a clear explanation for the image formation. While numerous theories exist, ranging from chemical reactions to artistic methods, none have conclusively replicated the shroud's intricate details. Skeptics argue that without a plausible physical or artistic process, the shroud's authenticity remains in question. From the skeptic's perspective, the enduring fascination with the shroud often intersects more with the realms of faith and belief than with empirical evidence. They contend that while the shroud may be a subject of spiritual significance for many, its historical and scientific authenticity, as the burial cloth of Jesus remains unproven, in the skeptic's view, the Shroud of Turin represents a complex interplay of history, faith, and science. While its mystery continues to captivate the imagination, skeptics remind us of the importance of critical inquiry and evidence-based conclusions. The Shroud, for all its intrigue and allure, remains an open question, a canvas onto which the mysteries of history and human belief are continuously painted. Yeah, so this, this segment did not make me more skeptical <laughs> I, I feel like Listen, we I covered give it, it. To you, Nick. yeah i feel like we covered it from the beginning like that whole contaminating the uh the thing for future tests which i mean they had good intention they didn't mean to um and regardless of what reasons the church has to not want people to touch it now that's only exacerbating the problem but um I feel like the scientists should have known better than that. They should have known that story. If we know that story, they must have knew that story. I would assume so. But the other thing is, in their defense, mm -hmm. they gave him the shroud for a very short time frame. I forget what it was. is a very short amount of time, and they were rushing. Yeah. yeah. Mistakes happen when you rush. I'm not saying yeah. they're right or they're wrong. If, if I heard probable. it right before, it was under their supervision, so it was probably only a couple hours or something like that. I'm sure it was a very, I know it was a very short time frame. Very yeah. short. Yeah, because they don't want it exposed to light or air or, and I think the, the newest rule is you can't take any samples whatsoever of it anymore. Supposedly, they're going to allow them to do it one more time, okay. but they've never gave them a time they can do it. Mm. We got one more chance does not to make this good. right. Pretty much. Pretty much. But I think they agreed to allow them to do it one more time, but to make sure they did not do it from the part they did it from last time. Yeah. It, it's, I hope it's pretty obvious where is the least touched of it, right? Well, and here's the thing. I don't know that they're going to get a perfect sample period because. Mm. I mean, the, the freaking thing was on fire for a minute. Yeah, I know. 
And that it was scorched, and there's going to be smoke on top of it. That's yeah. going to mess. Yeah. Well, that's if going you're to doing mess carbon, with the carbon dating. dating. Yeah, because that's carbon. So correct. So it's already been weakened. Yeah. Ah, darn that fire. Messed so I don't know up. that it will ever be conclusive. I don't think they'll yeah. ever be able to have it be conclusive. That being said, mm-hmm. science says we have to do it. But here's the thing. I don't necessarily believe in radiocarbon dating period. Hmm. I, I, I'm a pretty firm believer that within a certain tolerance, it's pretty accurate. What's the tolerance? I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but I would say it's like, I don't know, maybe what, 50 years or something like that, depending on how old it is, maybe. They tell you that they cannot accurately predict the mm. age of something until it's past 100 years old. Oh, really? Oh. Yes. Well, I, I believe it has its purpose. I don't think it's like 100% accurate. They're not going to tell you the year something is, but I believe it It works. My problem with it is I think it's way too inaccurate mm. to, to provide anything. Prime example. They found a woolly mammoth. Right. I forget when it was like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something, right? I was reading this article. I found it hilarious. They sent uh, something, same part of the mammoth, but different haunch parts of it, right? Mm -hmm. They they did testing on how old this woolly mammoth was. Right. Two different uh, specimens, same lab, Mm -hmm. same process. There was a 20,000 year difference between the two parts of the mammoth. Oh, that that's pretty big. Pretty big difference. Yeah. Uh, they did a tortoise shell, mm-hmm. a piece of a tortoise shell, radiocarbon dated it from 2 million years ago. And they was like, this is quite a find. The turtle was still alive. It was like a hundred uh-huh. years old. Yeah. That's embarrassing. But their point is, they say, we can't accurately prove that it works unless it's over 100 years old. Mm. But then older things, they've never been correct on either. So occasionally they're right. I think there's t- too much room for error, right? Like we, we mm-hmm. say we can't, in a court of law, use a lie detector, a right. polygraph. Mm-hmm. Why can't we? Because there's, it's not 100% accurate. Yeah, there's too much circumstances. Room for error. Can, yeah. But the science community goes, radiocarbon dating, it's legit. The other thing that we need to think about is Mm. oxygen has changed in the last 500 years. Right. But you're telling, and part of radiocarbon dating is looking at what? Oxygen. The the oxygen levels. Who's to say the oxygen was the same? Think about it. Dinosaurs wouldn't survive by today's standards because of the difference in the oxygen. So you're telling me. We know what the auction was 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 5,000 mm-hmm. years ago, 10,000 years ago, a million years ago. Right. We don't know. We wasn't there. True. I don't think we have any Science, other methods to do it right now, don't. though. But, but I think it's fair, right? Mm-hmm. This, is the, this is the thing that torques me off about right. the science community. We're going to use this, but we, it's a little inaccurate. But mm-hmm. then when we... On the other side with paranormal go, I just had an EMF hit. Okay, but it's not 100% accurate. Mm. Okay. Uh, we use cases like, uh, let's use, for example, um, EVPs, electric voice phenomena, right? We go, that sounds like X, Y, and Z. Well, it could have been the wind. Mm. Science works for science when science says this is supposed to be the way we go. Mm. Science has an issue when it's on the other side and we try to use that same technology. I, I would so say that's more like up this, to the individual than the the science itself or the paranormal person itself. Like each person is going to portray it differently. Sure. But I mean in general, right? Mm. Like science says that you can't use an EMF detector to determine ghosts. Right. But they, they don't understand why it goes off, but they go, mm. it doesn't really matter. The, the yeah. science is not strong enough. Or... Like we don't use a polygraph test in a court of law because it's too inaccurate, but we're mm. saying radiocarbon dating is perfect for stuff like this. Mm. 
we can't use it in some cases and not use other things in other cases based on how effective or ineffective it is that I don't know that they've ever truly radiocarbon dated something exact, perfect mm. every single time. Well, and they I, say I, there's always room <laughs> for error. I, I guess without any other method, you would have no idea whether know, it's yeah. right, you know? Yeah, for so, sure. I agree. I'm just saying, uh, regardless of what that radiocarbon test comes back to, mm. that wouldn't be definitive to me anyway. Right. But if they want it to test it, have at it. But I don't mm. think they'll ever come back to the exact time of Christ's burial, regardless, mm. because I think it's already been compromised with that fire. Right. But just as importantly, I don't think that the radiocarbon dating is accurate enough to do that anyway. What if it came back exactly the time of the crucifixion of Christ? Would that increase your I belief? St- I still wouldn't believe it. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. That's fair. Because it's inaccurate, right? Mm. Like a prime example, we found rocks on the moon that's older than the rocks on Earth. Mm. But they're formed around the same time period. In fact, the rock is supposed to be particles of Earth and some scientific, which now they're starting to go, well, maybe that's not 100% accurate. But you're telling me that that, the the, the moon is older than the Earth? How does that make any sense? Mm. Then they go, well, maybe it's because the auction, there's no auction in space, so it changed it. We got to pick and choose because the auction's not been the same for us for the last 500 years. We know this. This is scientifically accurate. Every single year, the auction level changes. We know this. Mm. We can scientifically prove this. We prove it. It comes out in the science journal every year. But they go, there's there's margin of error. Okay. Did you check it a thousand years ago? No, Mm. because it didn't exist. (laughs) Uh, i i get where you're coming from on that and i do sympathize in some cases however what we're comparing these are our two options yeah shaky science based Mm -hmm. on inaccurate facts sometimes or or faith sure faith is your feeling on something and you can have feelings in science too so I think they're two flawed methods of understanding the world around us. Um, I think that science has a lot of value and I think faith has a lot of value. But for one side to criticize the other is not comparing apples to apples. That's what I'm saying. I think you got to yeah. throw it out. I don't think there's any... Like there's no proof, regardless of what you choose is faith. Right. Faith is on both sides. You, you choose what Either you're going to believe or not. Carbon. Correct. That's yeah. the beauty of, of life. Mm-hmm. That's the beauty. That's one of our God given rights. We can choose what we want to believe. Yep. That's right. And until we have proof really otherwise. Rap- well, yeah, it doesn't we matter. We'll, we'll never have that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Until we get into the matrix, we'll never know. Yeah, right? that's right. Or out of the matrix. <laughs> true yeah are you ready for the wrap up on this yeah let's wrap her up as we reach the end of our journey through the veiled paths of history faith and science the shroud of turin remains an artifact of profound mystery and enduring fascination in its threads we have seen the intertwining of ancient narratives and modern scrutiny of deep-seated beliefs and the relentless quest for truth The Shroud of Turin, a simple piece of linen, has captivated the human spirit beyond the confines of time and geography. It has sparked debates that transcend the boundaries between the physical and the metaphysical, challenging both the skeptic and the believer alike. From its elusive origins to the mysterious formation of its image, the Shroud invites us to ponder the larger questions of our existence. It stands as a symbol of our enduring desire to understand the unknown, to find meaning in the relics of the past, and to reconcile the realms of faith and reason. Each of us, in our own way, may find a reflection of our deepest inquiries in the story of the Shroud. It invites us to embark on a personal and collective journey of exploration where answers are not as vital as the questions we ask and the openness with which we seek. As we close this chapter on the Shroud of Turin, we are reminded that some mysteries are not meant to be solved in their entirety, but rather experienced, contemplated, and cherished. 
The shroud, in its silent eloquence, continues to be a testament to the enduring human spirit that seeks, questions, and wonders at the tapestry of life. It was kind and of if a you pun listen there. to that, if you listen to that little segment right there, Nick, mm-hmm. basically what we just said is yeah. exactly what it ended on. Mm-hmm. And I, I truly do believe it's again, it's a, it's a case of faith, no matter how you look at it. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I, and a lot of people would disagree with me. This is sort of like how you the other day was like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble with the Christian community for saying this about this. Well, this is what I get in trouble with the agnostic atheist community. And when I say this is like, even if I had the ability to, I wouldn't take away people's faith anyway. No, no, I think it's important as well. I think it's important across all facets. And I think that people don't understand the power of having a belief in something, Mm. whether it's right or wrong. Sometimes being wrong about stuff, but having faith in something has helped people live through things. So at the end of the day, Whatever you believe, as long as it doesn't harm you or put you in the wrong direction in life, mm-hmm. okay yeah. for me. Heck yeah, I, I think so, there's a lot of value so in that. What do you think of this one, Nick? Uh, what do you I think of this a episode? Lot. Nick? I this is probably what, the topic that you've brought to me that I knew the most about of any that you've we've talked about. But there was a lot here I didn't know, and a lot for me to learn. Um, and I know you're going to do some research after too, because I know you, you're going to look some stuff oh, up. Yeah. yeah I'm going to look some stuff up. Um, but yeah, it's especially these, the, the 3d or the 3d imaging where it's, he's sort of like almost sitting up. I want to know a little bit more about that. So I'm going to look into that, but this, this was fascinating. I like this. This is a good topic. And not a lot of people. Not a lot of people talks about the three dimensional leaning mm. up. They just I'd never they picked it. it the way it is. Never heard it once. Yeah, not a lot of people talk about it. I actually, uh, when they first depicted the first three D model, I go, "Why is he sitting up like that?" And mm. I couldn't quite figure it out. But then I thought, well, maybe that's the way they laid him in there, and that's the way that it was. Mm. But then I started doing research, and they never did that. They laid him straight down, so it didn't yeah. make sense. Yeah, well, that's like how the depictions I'd always seen before was like he was laying straight down. Now, one thought that come to me at first in it, then I thought, well, no, that doesn't make sense. Because I was like, well, I can see his legs being up like that, up on the cross, and his head being like bowed down like that. And maybe this is like a case of rigor mortis if he was up there long enough. But then I'm like, well, his arms aren't in the right position. So that can't be. Because you don't just get it selectively. It's all body the, or the, not. The, the the faith part of me initially mm. thought it almost looked like he's being carried. Mm. Oh, I can see that. I can see that. Because like when I'm carrying one of my kids to bed, mm. that's what their bodies look like. Okay. I can and the first see thing that. that I thought, the first thing I thought was, you know, there's always that depiction of, you know, why wasn't you with me, God, when we was mm. walking? I only saw one set of footprints. And he's like, well, that's because I was carrying you, my son. Mm. That was the depiction I have. But then the more I thought about it, I'm like, I don't think that's right. I think that he's trying to get out of, get out of the crypt. Yeah. Yeah, I'm more thing inclined that to I believe that than the other one, I think. this. Yeah. The other thing that I didn't mention mm-hmm. that is there, and this is what we're going to close off. I said I was going to leave you with one more little tidbit before we left. Mm-hmm. The hair wouldn't clump like that. The hair is straight down. Mm. Interesting. So if you look at the three dimensional way the hair is laying, it wouldn't have laid like that. Yeah. Interesting. There's a lot to think about. You've got long hair. Oh yeah. I know all about that stuff. You've got long hair. I think that's why I sympathize with him. (laughs) But if you think about it. Yeah. When your hair is down. Mm Mm-hmm. Your hair's not doing what his hair is doing either, no. unless you're getting no. up. You're right. That is right. And that's the way the shroud depicts it. Interesting. In three dimensions. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that. that that's just interesting. Again, not very many people. I don't mm. know that I've ever heard anyone talk about the hair, but that was the first no. thing I noticed when I started. No, I haven't heard any of this photos. stuff. 
That's mm-hmm. interesting. So just food for thoughts. Yeah. All of you that stuck around to the end, that was my little tidbit, the little hair thing for mm-hmm. the left. But hopefully you all enjoyed this episode as much as I did, giving it to you guys, a little story part of it. If you could, in the comments below, let me know what your favorite part is. Is there something that you know that I don't know that we could have possibly address later? That's what I want to know. What did y'all, what do y'all know that I don't know? I did research. You better do more research than me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And look at the pictures on Instagram. You really got to take a look at AI Jesus. He is a nice man. <laughs> that's what nick is stuck on ai yeah. jesus man yeah i uh, i am i feel bad that i doubted him man that's a tough one i know well hopefully we get you guys to come back again this was a killer episode thank you nick for so much for let oh, me talk through this one thank you i loved it well until the next podcast goodbye see you later <laughs>